human, all too human a book for free spirits. By Friedrich Nietzsche. Audiobook 16x24. Yet this mistake is made in nearly all biographies. 395. Not buying too dear. The things that we buy too dear we generally turn to bad use, because we have no love for them but only a painful recollection. Thus they involve a twofold drawback. 396. The philosophy that society always needs. The pillars of the social structure rest upon the fundamental fact that everyone cheerfully contemplates all that he is, does, and attempts, his sickness or health, his poverty or affluence, his honor or insignificance, and says to himself, after all, I would not change places with anyone. Whoever wishes to add a stone to the social structure should always try to implant in mankind this cheerful philosophy of contentment and refusal to change places. 397. The Mark of a Noble Soul A noble soul is not that which is capable of the highest flights, but that which rises little and falls little, living always in a free and bright atmosphere and altitude. 398. Greatness and its Contemplator The noblest effect of greatness is that it gives the contemplator a power of vision that magnifies and embellishes. 399. Being Satisfied We show that we have attained maturity of understanding when we no longer go where rare flowers lurk under the thorniest hedges of knowledge, but are satisfied with gardens, forests, meadows, and plowlands remembering that life is too short for the rare and uncommon. 400. Advantage in Privation He who always lives in the warmth and fullness of the heart, and, as it were, in the summer air of the soul, cannot form an idea of that fearful delight which seizes more wintry natures, who for once in a way are kissed by the rays of love and the milder breath of a sunny February day. 401. Recipe for the Sufferer You find the burden of life too heavy? Then you must increase the burden of your life. When the sufferer finally thirsts after and seeks the river of Lethe, then he must become a hero to be certain of finding it. 402. The Judge He who has seen another's ideal becomes his inexorable judge, and as it were his evil conscience. 403. The Utility of Great Renunciation The useful thing about great renunciation is that it invests us with that youthful pride through which we can thenceforth easily demand of ourselves small renunciations. 404. How Duty Acquires a Glamour You can change a brazen duty into gold in the eyes of all by always performing something more than you have promised. 405. Prayer to mankind forgive us our virtues. So should we pray to mankind. 406. They that create and they that enjoy. Everyone who enjoys thinks that the principal thing to the tree is the fruit, but in point of fact the principal thing to it is the seed. Herein lies the difference between them that create and them that enjoy. 407. The glory of all great men. What is the use of genius if it does not invest him who contemplates and reveres it with such freedom and loftiness of feeling that he no longer has need of genius? To make themselves superfluous is the glory of all great men. 408. The Journey to Hades I too have been in the underworld, even as Odysseus, and I shall often be there again. Not sheep alone have I sacrificed that I might be able to converse with a few dead souls, but not even my own blood have I spared. There were four pairs who responded to me in my sacrifice. Epicurus and Montaigne, Goethe and Spinoza, Plato and Rousseau, Pascal and Schopenhauer. With them I have to come to terms. When I have long wandered alone, I will let them prove me right or wrong, to them will I listen, if they prove each other right or wrong. In all that I say, conclude, or think out for myself and others, I fasten my eyes on those eight and see their eyes fastened on mine. May the living forgive me if I look upon them at times as shadows, 
so pale and fretful, so restless and, alas, so eager for life. Those eight, on the other hand, seem to me so living that I feel as if even now, after their death, they could never become weary of life. But eternal vigor of life is the important point. What matters eternal life, or indeed life at all? Part 2 The Wanderer and His Shadow The Shadow It is so long since I heard you speak that I should like to give you an opportunity of talking. The Wanderer I hear a voice. Where? Whose? I almost fancied that I heard myself speaking, but with a voice yet weaker than my own. The Shadow after a pause. Are you not glad to have an opportunity of speaking? The Wanderer. By God and everything else in which I disbelieve, it is my shadow that speaks. I hear it, but I do not believe it. The Shadow. Let us assume that it exists, and think no more about it. In another hour all will be over. The Wanderer. That is just what I thought when in a forest near Pisa I saw first two and then five camels. The shadow. It is all the better if we are both equally forbearing towards each other when for once our reason is silent. Thus we shall avoid losing our tempers in conversation, and shall not at once apply mutual thumbscrews in the event of any word sounding for once unintelligible to us. If one does not know exactly how to answer, it is enough to say something. Those are the reasonable terms on which I hold conversation with any person. During a long talk the wisest of men becomes a fool once and a simpleton thrice. The Wanderer Your moderation is not flattering to those to whom you confess it. The Shadow Am I, then, to flatter? The Wanderer I thought a man's shadow was his vanity. Surely vanity would never say, Am I, then? to flatter. The shadow. Nor does human vanity, so far as I am acquainted with it, ask, as I have done twice, whether it may speak. It simply speaks. The wanderer. Now I see for the first time how rude I am to you, my beloved shadow. I have not said a word of my supreme delight in hearing and not merely seeing you. You must know that I love shadows even as I love light. For the existence of beauty of face, clearness of speech, kindliness and firmness of character, the shadow is as necessary as the light. They are not opponents rather do they hold each other's hands like good friends, and when the light vanishes, the shadow glides after it. The shadow. Yes, and I hate the same thing that you hate. Night. I love men because they are votaries of life. I rejoice in the gleam of their eyes when they recognize and discover, they who never weary of recognizing and discovering. That shadow which all things cast when the sunshine of knowledge falls upon them. That shadow too am I. The Wanderer. I think I understand you, although you have expressed yourself in somewhat shadowy terms. You are right. Good friends give to each other here and there, as a sign of mutual understanding, an obscure phrase which to any third party is meant to be a riddle. And we are good friends, you and I. So enough of preambles. Some few hundred questions oppress my soul, and the time for you to answer them is perchance but short. Let us see how we may come to an understanding as quickly and peaceably as possible. The Shadow but shadows are more shy than men. You will not reveal to any man the manner of our conversation? The Wanderer. The manner of our conversation? Heaven preserve me from wire-drawn, literary dialogues. If Plato had found less pleasure in spinning them out, his readers would have found more pleasure in Plato. A dialogue that in real life is a source of delight, when turned into writing and read, is a picture with nothing but false perspectives. Everything is too long or too short. Yet perhaps I may reveal the points on which we have come to an understanding? The Shadow. With that I am content. 
for everyone will only recognize your views once more, and no one will think of the shadow. The Wanderer Perhaps you are wrong, my friend. Hitherto they have observed in my views more of the shadow than of me. The shadow. More of the shadow than of the light? Is that possible? The wanderer. Be serious, dear fool. My very first question demands seriousness. 1. Of the tree of knowledge. Probability, but no truth, the semblance of freedom, but no freedom. These are the two fruits by virtue of which the tree of knowledge cannot be confounded with the tree of life. 2. The world's reason. That the world is not the abstract essence of an eternal reasonableness is sufficiently proved by the fact that that bit of the world which we know, I mean our human reason, is none too reasonable. And if this is not eternally and wholly wise and reasonable, the rest of the world will not be so either. Here the conclusion a minori ad magis, a part ad totem holds good, and that with decisive force. 3. In the beginning was. To glorify the origin. That is the metaphysical aftershoot which sprouts again at the contemplation of history, and absolutely makes us imagine that in the beginning of things lies all that is most valuable and essential. 4. Standard for the value of truth. The difficulty of climbing mountains is no gauge of their height. Yet in the case of science it is different. We are told by certain persons who wish to be considered the initiated. The difficulty in finding truth is to determine the value of truth. This insane morality originates in the idea that truths are really nothing more than gymnastic appliances, with which we have to exercise ourselves until we are thoroughly tired. It is a morality for the athletes and gymnasts of the intellect. 5. Use of words and reality. There exists a simulated contempt for all the things that mankind actually holds most important, for all everyday matters. For instance, we say we only eat to live. An abominable lie, like that which speaks of the procreation of children as the real purpose of all sexual pleasure. Conversely, the reverence for the most important things is hardly ever quite genuine. The priests and metaphysicians have indeed accustomed us to a hypocritically exaggerated use of words regarding these matters, but they have not altered the feeling that these most important things are not so important as those despised everyday matters. A fatal consequence of this twofold hypocrisy is that we never make these everyday matters, such as eating, housing, clothes, and intercourse, the object of a constant unprejudiced and universal reflection and revision, but, as such a process appears degrading, we divert from them our serious intellectual and artistic side. Hence in such matters habit and frivolity win an easy victory over the thoughtless, especially over inexperienced youth. On the other hand, our continual transgressions of the simplest laws of body and mind reduce us all, young and old to a disgraceful state of dependence and servitude. I mean to that fundamentally superfluous dependence upon physicians, teachers, and clergymen, whose dead weight still lies heavy upon the whole of society. 6. Earthly infirmities and their main cause. If we look about us, we are always coming across men who have eaten eggs all their lives without observing that the oblong shape tastes the best who do not know that a thunderstorm is beneficial to the stomach, that perfumes are most fragrant in cold, clear air, that our sense of taste varies in different parts of our mouths, that every meal at which we talk well or listen well does harm to the digestion. If we are not satisfied with these examples of defective powers of observation, we shall concede all the more readily that the everyday matters are very imperfectly seen and rarely observed by the majority. Is this a matter of indifference? Let us remember, after all, that from this defect are derived nearly all the bodily and spiritual infirmities of the individual. Ignorance of what is good and bad for us, in the arrangement of our mode of life, the division of our day, the selection of our friends and the time we devote to them, in business and leisure, commanding and obeying, 
our feeling for nature and for art, our eating, sleeping, and meditation, ignorance and lack of keen perceptions in the smallest and most ordinary details. This it is that makes the world a veil of tears for so many. Let us not say that here as everywhere the fault lies with human unreason. Of reason there is enough and to spare, but it is wrongly directed and artificially diverted from these little intimate things. Priests and teachers, and the sublime ambition of all idealists, coarser and subtler, din it even into the child's ears that the means of serving mankind at large depend upon altogether different things. Upon the salvation of the soul, the service of the state, the advancement of science, or even upon social position and property, whereas the needs of the individual, his requirements great and small during the twenty-four hours of the day, are quite paltry or indifferent. Even Socrates attacked with all his might this arrogant neglect of the human for the benefit of humanity, and loved to indicate by a quotation from Homer the true sphere and conception of all anxiety and reflection. All that really matters, he said, is the good and evil hap I find at home. 7. Two Means of Consolation Epicurus, the sole comforter of later antiquity, said, with that marvelous insight which to this very day is so rarely to be found, that for the calming of the spirit the solution of the final and ultimate theoretical problems is by no means necessary. Hence, instead of raising a barren and remote discussion of the final question, whether the gods existed, it sufficed him to say to those who were tormented by fear of the gods. If there are gods, they do not concern themselves with us. The latter position is far stronger and more favorable, for, by conceding a few points to the other, one makes him readier to listen and to take to heart. But as soon as he sets about proving the opposite, that the gods do concern themselves with us, into what thorny jungles of error must the poor man fall, quite of his own accord, and without any cunning on the part of his interlocutor. The latter must only have enough subtlety and humanity to conceal his sympathy with this tragedy. Finally, the other comes to feel disgust. The strongest argument against any proposition discussed with his own hypothesis. He becomes cold, and goes away in the same frame of mind as the pure atheist who says, What do the gods matter to me? The devil take them. In other cases, especially when a half physical, Half moral assumption had cast a gloom over his spirit, Epicurus did not refute the assumption. He agreed that it might be true, but that there was a second assumption to explain the same phenomenon, and that it could perhaps be maintained in other ways. The plurality of hypotheses, for example, that concerning the origin of conscientious scruples, suffices even in our time to remove from the soul the shadows that arise so easily from pondering over a hypothesis which is isolated, merely visible, and hence overvalued a hundredfold. Thus whoever wishes to console the unfortunate, the criminal, the hypochondriac, the dying, may call to mind the two soothing suggestions of Epicurus, which can be applied to a great number of problems. In their simplest form they would run. Firstly, granted the thing is so, it does not concern us, secondly, the thing may be so, but it may also be otherwise. 8. In the night. So soon as night begins to fall our sensations concerning everyday matters are altered. There is the wind, prowling as if on forbidden paths, whispering as if in search of something, fretting because he cannot find it. There is the lamplight with its dim red glow, its weary look, unwillingly fighting against night, a sullen slave to wakeful man. There are the breathings of the sleeper, with their terrible rhythm, to which an ever-recurring care seems to blow the trumpet melody. We do not hear it, but when the sleeper's bosom heaves we feel our heart strings tighten, and when the breath sinks and almost dies away into a deathly stillness, we say to ourselves, rest a while poor troubled spirit. All living creatures bear so great a burden that we wish them an eternal rest, night invites to death. 
If human beings were deprived of the sun and resisted night by means of moonlight and oil lamps, what a philosophy would cast its veil over them? We already see only too plainly how a shadow is thrown over the spiritual and intellectual nature of man by that moiety of darkness and sunlessness that envelopes life. 9. Origin of the Doctrine of Free Will Necessity sways one man in the shape of his passions, another as a habit of hearing and obeying, a third as a logical conscience, a fourth as a caprice and a mischievous delight in evasions. These four, however, seek the freedom of their will at the very point where they are most securely fettered. It is as if the silkworm sought freedom of will in spinning. What is the reason? Clearly this, that every one thinks himself most free where his vitality is strongest, hence, as I have said, now in passion, now in duty, now in knowledge, now in caprice. A man unconsciously imagines that where he is strong, where he feels most thoroughly alive, the element of his freedom must lie. He thinks of dependence and apathy, independence and vivacity as forming inevitable pairs. Thus an experience that a man has undergone in the social and political sphere is wrongly transferred to the ultimate metaphysical sphere. There the strong man is also the free man, there the vivid feeling of joy and sorrow, the high hopes, the keen desires, the powerful hates are the attributes of the ruling, independent natures, while the thrall and the slave live in a state of dazed oppression. The doctrine of free will is an invention of the ruling classes. 10. Absence of feeling of new chains. So long as we do not feel that we are in some way dependent, we consider ourselves independent. A false conclusion that shows how proud man is, how eager for dominion. For he hereby assumes that he would always be sure to observe and recognize dependence so soon as he suffered it, the preliminary hypothesis being that he generally lives in independence, and that, should he lose that independence for once in a way, he would immediately detect a contrary sensation. Suppose, however, the reverse to be true. That he is always living in a complex state of dependence, but thinks himself free where, through long habit, he no longer feels the weight of the chain? He only suffers from new chains, and free will really means nothing more than an absence of feeling of new chains. 11. Freedom of the will and the isolation of facts. Our ordinary inaccurate observation takes a group of phenomena as one and calls them a fact. Between this fact and another we imagine a vacuum, we isolate each fact. In reality, however, the sum of our actions and cognitions is no series of facts and intervening vacua, but a continuous stream. Now the belief in free will is incompatible with the idea of a continuous, uniform, undivided, indivisible flow. This belief presupposes that every single action is isolated and indivisible, it is an atomic theory as regards volition and cognition. We misunderstand facts as we misunderstand characters, speaking of similar characters and similar facts, whereas both are non-existent. Further, we bestow praise and blame only on this false hypothesis, that there are similar facts, that a graduated order of species of facts exists, corresponding to a graduated order of values. Thus we isolate not only the single fact, but the groups of apparently equal facts, good, evil, compassionate, envious actions, and so forth. In both cases we are wrong. The word and the concept are the most obvious reason for our belief in this isolation of groups of actions. We do not merely thereby designate the things, the thought at the back of our minds is that by the word and the concept we can grasp the essence of the actions. We are still constantly led astray by words and actions, and are induced to think of things as simpler than they are, as separate, indivisible, existing in the absolute. Language contains a hidden philosophical mythology, which, however careful we may be, breaks out afresh at every moment. The belief in free will. That is to say, in similar facts and isolated facts. 
finds in language its continual apostle and advocate. 12. The Fundamental Errors A man cannot feel any psychical pleasure or pain unless he is swayed by one of two illusions. Either he believes in the identity of certain facts, certain sensations, and in that case finds spiritual pleasure and pain in comparing present with past conditions and in noting their similarity or difference, as is invariably the case with recollection, or he believes in the freedom of the will, perhaps when he reflects, I ought not to have done this, this might have turned out differently, and from these reflections likewise he derives pleasure and pain. Without the errors that are rife in every psychical pain and pleasure, humanity would never have developed. For the root idea of humanity is that man is free in a world of bondage. Man, the eternal wonder worker, whether his deeds be good or evil. Man, the amazing exception, the super beast, the quasi god, the mind of creation, the indispensable, the keyword to the cosmic riddle the mighty lord of nature and despiser of nature, the creature that calls its history the history of the world. Vanitas Vanitatum Homo 13. Repetition It is an excellent thing to express a thing consecutively in two ways, and thus provide it with a right and a left foot. Truth can stand indeed on one leg, but with two she will walk and complete her journey. 14. Man is the comic actor of the world. It would require beings more intellectual than men to relish to the full the humorous side of man's view of himself as the goal of all existence and of his serious pronouncement that he is satisfied only with the prospect of fulfilling a world mission. If a god created the world, he created man to be his ape, as a perpetual source of amusement in the midst of his rather tedious eternities. The music of the spheres surrounding the world would then presumably be the mocking laughter of all the other creatures around mankind. God in his boredom uses pain for the tickling of his favorite animal, in order to enjoy his proudly tragic gestures and expressions of suffering, and, in general, the intellectual inventiveness of the vainest of his creatures. As inventor of this inventor for he who invented man as a joke had more intellect and more joy in intellect than has man. Even here, where our human nature is willing to humble itself, our vanity again plays us a trick, in that we men should like in this vanity at least to be quite marvelous and incomparable. Our uniqueness in the world. Oh, what an improbable thing it is. Astronomers, who occasionally acquire a horizon outside our world, give us to understand that the drop of life on the earth is without significance for the total character of the mighty ocean of birth and decay, that countless stars present conditions for the generation of life similar to those of the earth. And yet these are but a handful in comparison with the endless number that have never known, or have long been cured, of the eruption of life, that life on each of these stars, measured by the period of its existence, has been but an instant, a flicker, with long, long intervals afterwards. And thus in no way the aim and final purpose of their existence. Possibly the ant in the forest is quite as firmly convinced that it is the aim and purpose of the existence of the forest, as we are convinced in our imaginations, almost unconsciously, that the destruction of mankind involves the destruction of the world. It is even modesty on our part to go no farther than this and not to arrange a universal twilight of the world and the gods as the funeral ceremony of the last man. Even to the eye of the most unbiased astronomer a lifeless world can scarcely appear otherwise than as a shining and swinging star wherein man lies buried. 15. The Modesty of Man How little pleasure is enough for the majority to make them feel that life is good. How modest is man? 16 where indifference is necessary. Nothing would be more perverse than to wait for the truths that science will finally establish concerning the first and last things, and until then to think, and especially to believe, in the traditional way, as one is so often advised to do. The impulse that bids us seek nothing but certainties in this domain is a religious offshoot, nothing better. A hidden and only apparently skeptical variety of the metaphysical need, 
the underlying idea being that for a long time no view of these ultimate certainties will be obtainable, and that until then the believer has the right not to trouble himself about the whole subject. We have no need of these certainties about the farthermost horizons in order to live a full and efficient human life, any more than the ant needs them in order to be a good ant. Rather must we ascertain the origin of that troublesome significance that we have attached to these things for so long. For this we require the history of ethical and religious sentiments, since it is only under the influence of such sentiments that these most acute problems of knowledge have become so weighty and terrifying. Into the outermost regions to which the mental eye can penetrate, without ever penetrating into them, we have smuggled such concepts as guilt and punishment, everlasting punishment, too. The darker those regions, the more careless we have been. For ages men have let their imaginations run riot where they could establish nothing, and have induced posterity to accept these fantasies as something serious and true, with this abominable lie as their final trump card. That faith is worth more than knowledge. What we need now in regard to these ultimate things is not knowledge as against faith, but indifference as against faith and pretended knowledge in these matters. Everything must lie nearer to us than what has hitherto been preached to us as the most important thing, I mean the questions. What end does man serve? What is his fate after death? How does he make his peace with God? And all the rest of that bag of tricks. The problems of the dogmatic philosophers, be they idealists, materialists, or realists, concern us as little as do these religious questions. They all have the same object in view. To force us to a decision in matters where neither faith nor knowledge is needed. It is better even for the most ardent lover of knowledge that the territory open to investigation and to reason should be encircled by a belt of fog-laden, treacherous marshland, a strip of ever-watery, impenetrable and indeterminable country. It is just by the comparison with the realm of darkness on the edge of the world of knowledge that the bright, accessible region of that world rises in value. We must once more become good friends of the everyday matters, and not, as hitherto, despise them and look beyond them at clouds and monsters of the night. In forests and caverns, in marshy tracks and under dull skies, on the lowest rungs of the ladder of culture, man has lived for eons, and lived in poverty. There he has learned to despise the present, his neighbors, his life, and himself, and we, the inhabitants of the brighter fields of nature and mind, still inherit in our blood some taint of this contempt for everyday matters. 17. Profound Interpretations He who has interpreted a passage in an author more profoundly than was intended, has not interpreted the author but has obscured him. Our metaphysicians are in the same relation, or even in a worse relation, to the text of nature. For, to apply their profound interpretations, they often alter the text to suit their purpose. Or, in other words, corrupt the text. A curious example of the corruption and obscuration of an author's text is furnished by the ideas of Schopenhauer on the pregnancy of women. The sign of a continuous will to life in time, he says, is copulation, the sign of the light of knowledge which is associated anew with this will and holds the possibility of a deliverance, and that too in the highest degree of clearness, is the renewed incarnation of the will to life. This incarnation is betokened by pregnancy, which is therefore frank and open, and even proud, whereas copulation hides itself like a criminal. He declares that every woman, if surprised in the sexual act, would be likely to die of shame but displays her pregnancy without a trace of shame, nay even with a sort of pride. Now, firstly, this condition cannot easily be displayed more aggressively than it displays itself, and when Schopenhauer gives prominence only to the intentional character of the display, he is fashioning his text to suit the interpretation. Moreover, his statement of the universality of the phenomenon is not true. He speaks of every woman. Many women, especially the younger, often appear painfully ashamed of their condition, 
even in the presence of their nearest kinsfolk. And when women of riper years, especially in the humbler classes, do actually appear proud of their condition, it is because they would give us to understand that they are still desirable to their husbands. That a neighbor on seeing them or a passing stranger should say or think can it be possible. That is an alms always acceptable to the vanity of women of low mental capacity. In the reverse instance, to conclude from Schopenhauer's proposition, the cleverest and most intelligent women would tend more than any to exult openly in their condition. For they have the best prospect of giving birth to an intellectual prodigy, in whom the will can once more negative itself for the universal good. Stupid women, on the other hand, would have every reason to hide their pregnancy more modestly than anything they hide. It cannot be said that this view corresponds to reality. Audiobook generated by Read with the ears.